All right, now we're ready. Sorry for the delay. Um, today is a pretty exciting lecture. Like I was telling you last time, you know, midterm reviews are bleh, um, although that may have been my best midterm review ever. Today we get to start an exciting new topic, and so I'm uh, thrilled to be able to share with you some details about how memory works. Okay, so we've uh, been using computer memories all term so far, and we've had a pretty simple perspective, right? We say, well, I have addresses, and that'll get me back a byte. And I do stuff with it, save that value back to that address if I want to. Um, we have these two memory areas. We have the register file, which we know is small. Why did we want it to be small? So that we could keep our instructions from becoming jimungus. Okay, so that was kind of important. We also kind of intuitively think this is going to be fast, right? Because it's registers. Then we have main memory, which is much, much larger. Okay? And uh, so we can have very large addresses. Like on uh, x86-64, we have 48-bit addresses, whereas we only have 16 registers. So uh, the address of a register is 4 bits. The address of something in main memory is 48 bits. That's a lot of bits. Okay. And we had various ways of accessing these things. And of course, um, oh, I don't talk about it here. I guess I talk about, oh yeah, I talk about it on the very last point. So data alignment, we talked about the fact that, well, if we're going to use a 64-bit data bus, then clearly aligned accesses are probably better than non-aligned accesses. And so we talked about that a little bit as well. But so far, intuitively, we haven't really developed any sense of how this all behaves and why. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Okay. So here is the deal. Um, small memories are almost always faster than large ones. And you also notice that as we get larger and larger memories, we start using technologies and techniques that make the storage denser and denser. And when we have dense memory storage, it tends to dramatically increase the uh, cost of accessing it as well. Okay, so these tend to be the principles that you notice in, in computing systems. Okay, and uh, the reason why is physical. We're going to develop a little bit of this. This is not a physics class, but there will be some uh, small <laughs> Donny level physics in, in this lecture. Um, signals do take some time to propagate through a wire, and I don't know if any of you have ever looked up Grace Hopper. You totally should. But she would go to lectures and she would appear, I think she was even on Letterman once, which was great. But uh, there's a lot of information about her out there. And she would hand out foot-long pieces of wire and say, this is a nanosecond. That's how far a signal can propagate in one nanosecond. Now, that's nothing else going on, right? We're not operating on that signal at all. We're not doing any computations with it. We're just transmitting a signal. It takes a nanosecond to go a foot. So you can see that if you have a 3 gigahertz signal, which is um, not uncommon these days, I don't think that there's many systems that go up above that um, particularly much. Uh, you'll see about 4 inches per clock is how far signals are able to propagate per clock. Okay, And so you can see that if I make a circuit small, then signals have shorter distances to propagate through, and that means that I can make them go faster. And so that's part of what has driven this insane desire to try to shrink things as much as possible. Smaller things are, the shorter distances signals have to travel, and so then I can clock them faster, I can do computations faster. Okay? So this is part of what's going on here. Now, what's worse is that we have to operate on these signals as well. And so you have logic gates come into the picture, and logic gates are even worse than just plain old wires. Okay? You have propagation delays. Anybody who's done uh, any digital, like I keep wanting to say 5x, but I know that doesn't exist anymore. If you've been one of the lucky ones and taken 5x, I'm sure you've thought about this a great deal. Uh, I remember when I was in 5x, and Glenn would make us do the timing diagrams to make sure everything would work properly. And uh, that's actually a really important part of computer system design because the gates add delays to the computations. And so like I say on the slide, the more things that you have that you have to drive, you know, the more things that a particular gate is driving, the longer it takes for that gate to settle to its final state. And the longer the wire is that the gate has to drive, the longer it takes for the gate to settle to its final state. This sucks, right? This adds in time to our computations. Okay, so the more gates a signal has to propagate through, the slower the device is. Okay. 
These limits are affected by temperature as well, which is partly why we like to cool computing systems. Now, part of it is also we would like them not to explode. And again, if you get on YouTube, you can go and find a lot of videos of people removing heat sinks from processors, and then like within tens of seconds, they pop and it's quite entertaining. I don't know if they do that so much anymore. Um, back when I was your age, processors wouldn't have thermal detection and throttling circuits so that they wouldn't explode. Um, now many processors do, but uh, it's still pretty easy to get them to go boom. Okay, So that's part of it, but also we would like to be able to clock these things more quickly, and so if we can cool the circuit, then we can make it go faster. Now we're going to talk about a really simple example here just to illustrate how this causes things to slow down as we make our memories larger. So we're going to use multiplexers and demultiplexers. We're going to have uh, memory locations. We're going to keep it super simple using only things that we've already seen. This is like a brain dead four cell, you know, four by one bit memory. So four cells we can address with two address lines, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. We can feed in a value stored to a particular cell using the address, and uh, we can also pull out a value using the address. Okay, So easy enough, right? So this is four cells. We have a certain amount of delay that we're introducing into our circuits because we have to do this addressing. If we scale this up, let's square its size. Well, now we need to have two levels of multiplexers and two levels of demultiplexers just to do the addressing. Okay, everybody see that? So just by growing our circuitry, growing our number of addressable locations, we have to increase the sophistication of our addressing logic, and that slows down our memory. Okay? So we can do some like really high-level hand wavy, or if you will, if you want to give it a little bit more respectable name, back of the you know envelope calculation. Then uh, you could break down the memory access cost like this. So you have the addressing cost and the cell access cost. Okay, the cell access cost is going to be constant for whatever technology you're using. Okay, use SRAM, use DRAM, use whatever. That's going to be constant. So for end memory location, so the question here that we're asking is how does this addressing delay or this addressing cost scale with the number of memory locations? Pretty obvious, right? I squared the number of cells and it doubled the cost. What does that mean? <laughs> Real easy, right? It's logarithmic. Okay, so we have some constant and then we have a logarithmic cost that increases as our number of memory cells increase. So we see already, memory grows larger, access time is going to increase. Now it's not just that, because we also have to lay this memory out on a circuit of some kind, and so we'd like to come up with a simple layout that doesn't make our lives miserable, and uh, also is reasonably efficient as far as using this silicon wafer, and so let's say we choose a square memory layout, pretty typical, or some kind of rectangular layout. So again, we have the logic, our addressing, our cell access cost, but then we also have to shuffle these signals around. So we have wire transmission delays as well in this device. Okay, so T logic is going to have T cell and T adder, and uh, then we have T wire, which is the propagation time. So the question is, how is the wire propagation time going to increase or decrease as we scale n? Well, if we have everything laid out in a square, how long are the sides, right? We end up with another term, which is a square root term, or n to the 1 half. So we have all of these delays that are part of our memory access. And you can see that as we grow n, first of all, things are growing. That's kind of the fundamental takeaway here, is that the cost of accessing individual cells grows as we increase the memory size. Um, but the wire transmission actually becomes the worst part of this. Okay? The addressing logic doesn't grow quite as fast. 
But the result is unmistakable as we grow our memory size. Again, this is holding technology constant, right? Because we have different technologies. But if you hold the technology constant, then due to physics, larger memories are going to be slower than smaller memories. So you can see that we have another reason why we'd like to have a little tiny memory on the processor that's used by instructions, the register file. And that's going to be way faster than using the main memory that's on the motherboard. It's further away, it's larger, it's going to be slower to access, okay? just because of physics. All right, uh, any questions about that so far? All right, so that's a pretty interesting result. Um, it turns out that there's a whole bunch of different technologies used in modern computing systems. And honestly, I would love to give you like a nice historical enrichment lecture where I tell you about some of the wild old technologies that uh, have been used in the past. Um, that's part of the show and tell. So I actually, um, I might as well pull this out because the stuff we're talking about is not terribly complicated. Anybody know what this is? This is magnetic core memory. This is what was used in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s for uh, computers. This is a really, this is, oh, so the question is how much memory is this? I can't remember. I think it's 4,096 bits. I think that's how many. I think I, I think I tried to count them one time. And uh, anybody know how many bytes 4, 4K bits is? I'm trying to think off the top of my head. Is that like uh, 512 bytes? Did I get that right? So anyway, this is from a Univac, I think. And uh, this is from an HP computer. You can see that, you know... We, even back then, we were making things smaller and denser. And uh, then this is from, oh, I don't even know what this is from. This is the one that's really interesting, because this is from a Soviet uh, military computer. So, and you can, so I'm going to pass these around if you guys want to take a look. Try not to destroy them. I bought them out of my own pocket on eBay. them around, have fun. But anyway, um, one of the interesting characteristics about that kind of memory is actually that it held its data even when power was off, because it used magnetic fields and toroidal cores. And so that would actually stick around for a, a while. And so you see this interesting characteristic of memories is that sometimes they hold their data when they're off, and sometimes they lose their data when they're off. Okay, and so we call this volatile versus non-volatile memory. So static RAM and dynamic RAM are both volatile. They lose their minds when you turn off power. Okay? Then you have non-volatile memory, which keeps its state when power is off. So you have read-only memories that are sort of uh, burned into the silicon so that you don't lose that information. Electrically erasable, programmable read-only memories flash storage, that kind of thing, and magnetic disk storage is another example. Now, you could probably come up with others, like optical storage, tape storage, all of these things that we don't really use too much anymore, okay? But uh, certainly those are other examples of non-volatile memory, okay? So computers use all of these. You know, thankfully, we don't use... Uh, <laughs> Uh, magnetic core memory anymore. Thankfully, we don't use uh, mercury delay line memory, which is so cool. Uh, I would love to tell you about that. Maybe if we have time at the end of the lecture, I'll tell you about it. It's the wildest thing. Uh, so random access memory. When we say random access memory, what we're saying is that you can access any address and it will be equal cost. Okay? We prefer memories that are that way so that we can access them. It's you know great for writing sorting algorithms and the like. Okay, so that's really nice. Um, you also have sequential access like magnetic tapes. CDs are kind of that way as well. Uh, optical storage tends to be sequential. Okay, it's much cheaper to access the thing that's adjacent as opposed to going to some random location. But so we really like to uh, use random access memory inside computers. So static RAM uses these memory cells that are bistable. You can either set them to zero or set them to one, and the state won't change as long as power is applied. Now, the principle behind this is really simple. We just have gates whose outputs are feeding into the inputs of other gates. Okay, so we can build a little feedback circuit. Okay? And then typically you have to build something into that to allow you to set its state. 
Okay? And so a D flip-flop is a great example of this. This is a simple flip-flop that uh, can be used to store one bit of data. Now this is complicated. We don't like to use D flip-flops when we build SRAM because this is just way too many transistors. But it illustrates the idea that you have gates whose output is fed to the inputs of other gates whose output is fed to, as inputs to other gates. Okay? So you build up this feedback uh, circuit. Real SRAM cells are going to use just a handful of transistors. I think I read somewhere that it's four transistors plus two transistors per port that you have on the SRAM. So um, if you want to have dual port SRAM so that you can read two different things at the same time, then you might have uh, eight transistors or something like that. But six transistors would be for single port uh, SRAM memory cell. Okay? Six transistors. I want you to keep that in your mind. We're going to talk about that. Here is the kind of layout that we might have. You can see that oh, that red, every time I see the red on the slide, it's hard to read. But um, you can see that you feed addresses into some addressing logic, and the addressing logic will activate one of these rows of memory cells. Okay? So each cell is maintaining its own state, and you send an address to the decoder. And that activates a specific row, which then drives data out, or it reads data in and stores it into the memory cell. Okay? So SRAM is pretty straightforward. You give it the whole address, it does its thing. Just like the little yellow boxes we've been talking about all term. Now, um, the horizontal row, like if you notice that the entire row comprises one word. So we're looking at each cell or each bit in the word. This happens to be an 8-bit word. Okay, And so when you activate a row, you're pulling out a whole word of data. The vertical lines are bit lines because each one corresponds to one bit in all of the cells. Okay. Oops. And uh, you, know, you might say, well, how do I get to 64 bits then? Well, you just plop down multiple of these memories next to each other. Okay. A lot of times you'll have 16-bit or 32-bit word sizes on memories, and they'll just plop down chips in parallel until so you get to the uh, word size that you want. You know, it's easy. Any questions about this? All right. Now, um, the thing about SRAM is you might say, well, six transistors, that doesn't sound too bad, but it actually takes up some space. Okay? And so that means that you are limited in how much memory you can fit onto a particular area. Now, there's another way of storing information that's much denser than this. Doesn't require transistors at all. Anybody know how DRAM works? What's underlying DRAM memory storage? Anybody know? Yeah. Yeah, capacitors. And yeah, leaky is right. In fact, I don't know a non-leaky capacitor. I think they all leak, but uh, <laughs> it's been a long time since I studied that stuff. Freshman year, sophomore year. But yeah, we can build another storage technology using capacitors to store data. Basically, we'll have two states. One is charged, that'll be a 1, and discharge will be a 0. Okay? Now, we still need a transistor because we need to be able to enable or disable access to a particular memory cell. Now, we have a problem that we have to solve as well, and this is uh, already you know, related to what was mentioned. Capacitors leak. And so if we store data in a capacitor and then come back in like five minutes, it's going to be gone. We're going to be sad because it's no longer there. Okay? So in some way, we need to be able to refresh the contents of these capacitors. By the way, I don't think this is important. You probably won't have any problems, but I'm sure that the solder on those boards has lead in it because it's from that era. <laughs> so you probably want to... Wash your hands before lunch, just FYI. Okay, um, I don't know. You're probably in much more danger picking up a cold off of one of those than uh, lead poisoning, but uh, just for the sake of uh, full disclosure. So anyway, we do need to refresh capacitors, and it's really interesting because all you do to refresh a capacitor in DRAM is to read it. Because the way that the logic works is that it actually refreshes the contents of the capacitor as it's read. So we call it dynamic RAM because the contents are unstable. You have to keep refreshing it to remember the contents. Okay? Now this is kind of the way you can think about DRAM. You've got a capacitor 
and you've got a transistor that will connect or not connect it to a circuit. Okay? And so when we uh, give the transistor a high signal, then that'll turn on the capacitor, or let's say connect it to the sense logic, and uh, when it's off, the capacitor is sort of on its own. The other thing about DRAM is that it actually receives its addresses in two parts. Why would it do that? Well, DRAM is a technology that's supposed to be very dense so that we can pack a lot of memory onto a piece of silicon. And if we can pack a lot of memory on, then the address bits start to get larger and larger. So one of the ways of mitigating the scaling of this uh, you know, address size is we break it into two pieces. Okay? We turn it into what's called a row address and a column address. So the memory is typically square. Now what I mean is like the total number of cells will be, I'm sorry, not the number of cells. The number of, um, the book calls them supercells, which is a good term, but the number of words that you're storing in your memory tends to be a square number. Uh, and then obviously the number of bits in each supercell is going to be whatever the bit width is of the uh, memory. Okay? So here's the way we access it. We specify a row address. Signal the DRAM, hey, there's a row address. Now that uses the address lines. Then we use the very same address lines to specify a column address. And then we say, hey, you have a column address now. At that point, the DRAM does something. You either get data out of it or you put data into it. Okay? So here's a picture. This is a whopping 16-bit DRAM. Uh, the word size is 1 bit because I didn't want to draw a 16 by 8 bit or something like that. That would be uh, horrendous, although it might illustrate a little bit more clearly. I just really, for the sake of understanding, the word size is 1 bit. This is not a 4 bit memory, this is a 1 bit memory. We just have 16 cells. Okay? So since we have 16 cells, we need 4 address uh, bits to access a particular cell. And so you can see that since we're breaking that into two parts, we have a row address, which is 2 bits, and a column address, which is 2 bits. And they use A0 and A1. They both use the same lines. Okay. All right, so I blabbered on about that. So you have horizontal word lines, which is kind of a weird use of the terminology. I'm going to revisit that. And uh, vertical bit lines. The vertical bit lines make obvious sense because those are what are coming down from the memory cells. Okay. So we specify the address in two steps. First thing we do is we say, here's a row that I want to access. Okay? So that goes in the address lines, and then we say, there's a row address. Now this is called row address strobe. And you probably, if, if you happen to be like me and look at Newegg every once in a while, or lust after new computers, you've probably seen DRAM modules, and they'll say things like RAS and CAS. And those are your row address strobe and your column address strobe. Now typically what they're saying is this is how long it takes before RAS completes and CAS completes so that you can see how fast the memory is. But you activate RAS and that captures, it takes a snapshot of the address values so that it doesn't forget them. It also happens to activate the whole row of cells that have that row address. Okay, so it's going to activate four memory cells in this uh, circumstance. Okay? Now this is where all the excitement happens. Now you see that little blue box, the bit sense amplify and let. What happens is all the little transistors turn on, and so all the little capacitors are connected to wires that come down into the bit sense and amplify. And if you imagine, you've got this itty bitty little capacitor, and it's got just a little tiny bit of charge, and so you connect that line to the transistor, and it'll go poof, and it'll just put out a few little electrons. Well, there's something sitting in that blue box, uh, an amplifier, that basically listens. And if it hears nothing, it forces it to be nothing. And if it hears anything, it forces it to be the full signal. That's basically what's happening here. And that's what causes the capacitor to be recharged. Because there's something listening on that wire. And when it hears anything, it forces it to a 1. Otherwise, it forces it to a 0. And so that's how that capacitor is recharged. Okay? That's part of the, uh, the refresh. Now the other part of that, which I don't want to go on without mentioning, is that the entire row will be captured. So now we have all of that data captured in the latch part of this blue box. Okay? 
Okay, so we've read all the data of that row down into the box. Okay, now we get the second part. Okay, so row address strobe is completed. Whoever is doing this uh, memory access has weighted the amount of clocks that we're supposed to wait. Then they put the column address on, and then they activate the column address strobe. And again, those address bits are captured like a snapshot in the column latch. And then that's used to access the appropriate cell of data out of the uh, blue box. And so that's how you access DRAM. Everybody see that? Wow, that's a lot of steps, right? That's like way more clocks than accessing SRAM. Remember SRAM? I give the whole address in one shot, and I just tell it to give me data, and boom, data comes out. Whereas this guy, we've got to like sweet talk it. Got to give it this part and then that part and do this line and that line and then data comes out. Okay, so you can see that this is slower to access. It's a different technology. Okay, just throw all of that up there. Okay, so yeah, this is just a little bit of uh, detail here. Our bit width here is just um, one. <laughs> so we have cells, but you can imagine that if your bit width was 16 or something, you'd have 16 capacitors and 16 transistors for each one of these cells. I just didn't want to draw that on the slide. So that's the one thing I wanted to make sure was really clear. Um, and so then each of these lines coming down vertically would actually be a bus, not just a single line. Okay, so that we could read all 16 bits or 8 bits at a time. All right, any questions about this? All righty, so that's DRAM. Now, um, that's a lot of steps, and modern processors don't want to deal with all that crap. They'd rather just let somebody else handle it. And so there's a special chip on your motherboard typically that's called a DRAM controller. That's one of the things that it does. And it interacts with the memory on behalf of the processor. So the processor, again, you're thinking abstractions, right? Processor outputs an address. The controller takes that address and feeds this part and activates RAS. And then it feeds this part and activates CAS, gets the data back, and tells the processor, hey, your, your data is ready. Okay. Also, we have this refresh issue. Funny side story. Well, I think it's fun. Um, back when I was in eighth grade or so, we got our first computer. And the um, computer did have DRAM, because we had DRAM back then. But um, the processor didn't have a DRAM controller. So the processor would talk directly to the DRAM. The processor was also responsible for refreshing the DRAM. And all of us crazy little kids that had computers and, and uh, wanted to make them faster. We couldn't really overclock them back then because the BIOS wouldn't let you control that kind of stuff. But what you could do is slow down the timer that was refreshing the DRAM. And so we would do that. We would slow down the DRAM refresh rate until we started getting bit errors in our memory. And then we're like, okay, we better back off. And you back off a little bit. And you get like a few percent performance improvement out of your computer. Okay. Weird stuff. You can't really do that anymore. Although I suppose you can specify RAS and CAS delays on uh, some boards, so um, maybe you could control it that way. All right, so DRAM controller, uh, yeah, it's going to handle the interaction between the CPU and memory, and it'll take care of all of these steps. So this is what I was talking about. Now, um, as far as refreshing, remember that the whole row of cells or the whole row of supercells is refreshed when I activate the row. So refreshing just means I need to periodically go and hit each one of these rows in sequence. Okay? So that's pretty cool. Um, all you do is say, this is the row I want to refresh, activate RAS, rows refreshed, and then you stop. You don't ha it's not going to sit there and wait for you to activate CAS. It's just going to like wait for you to do whatever you do next. Okay? So that's how that works. Questions? All right. Now, um, there are processors that know how to talk to DRAM directly. It tends to be a really bad idea. And the reason why that it tends to, I mean, why, you might ask the question, why would you do this in the first place? Well, again, closer things are together, the faster they go, the faster we can clock them. So if I put the controller on the chip, then I'll have a faster memory system. True, but the problem is that memory technologies change. Okay? And there are a whole bunch of different ways that people have taken this picture and made improvements to it, made it faster. Okay? You probably have seen all these like uh, 
little acronyms associated with DRAM modules, and you have to pick the right one or else your motherboard doesn't understand it. This is because people are improving on how DRAM works. Okay? And if that was on the processor and you wanted to upgrade your memory, then you're screwed. Okay? So it's better to put it off onto another uh, part of the uh, integrated circuits that are part of your computer. Okay? You can take the processor, drop it into another motherboard, and off you go. Something like that. Okay? Now, um, I want to tell you about one optimization because it's actually very common, very cool, and it will become relevant as we talk about some of the things in the next few lectures. Okay? Notice, optimizations for the common case. How do programs normally interact with memory? I'm computing a sum of values, or I'm, I'm, sc I'm scanning through the references in a garbage collector, something like that. I'm accessing contiguous regions of memory, right? Scanning through. Well, if that stuff is stored in DRAM, and when I activate RAS, I take the whole row and store it down into the bit sense box, why would I reload the whole row for the next memory access and then reload the whole row for the next memory access? That doesn't make any sense. If I know that I'm accessing values in the same row, why don't I just provide column addresses and say, hey, now give me this column address, now give me this column address, and so forth. That'll be a lot, that's like twice as fast, right? So that's called fast page mode. It keeps RAS active. That keeps the row of data in the blue box, and then I can just feed it column addresses until I'm out of that page. Go on to the next row, and then I can use... And so you can see that this dramatically improves the performance of interacting with DRAM. Okay? Typically, memory accesses are adjacent, so hey, let's make the common case fast, right? Yes? No, these pages will basically be just whatever the size of a row is inside the DRAM. This tends to be uh, something the DRAM controller knows about, and nobody else has to think about it. You know, so you think about it when you're designing the motherboard, um, and if that's your thing, good luck, help us all. But you know, most of the time, you don't think about this as a software programmer. Okay. okay. Any other questions? Um, yeah. What do, what do modern day computers use uh, like this type of memory? For? Like most of the things that are in our computer programs, files, so on, need to stay on after we turn it off. Yeah. So DRAM is definitely not used for for persistent storage. DRAM is what's going to be like your anywhere from two gigs to sixteen gigs of of main system memory that's used for applications. Or maybe you have more. If you have more, then I envy you. I got a 16-gig uh, memory on this laptop because I do so many virtual machines for classes that I was like, uh, I really should have a lot of memory to store all these VM images, keep them fast. OK, so SRAM and DRAM. SRAM is fast. We like fast, right? So these are probably 2017 numbers. I'd have to go check to see exactly when I looked them up. Uh, SRAM will be on the order of nanoseconds, 1 to 10 nanoseconds, and DRAM will be 30 to 100 nanoseconds. Sometimes you'll see DRAM that's even slower. But this is kind of one of the things that I want to mention, even with fast page mode. So you go from like 100 nanoseconds to 50 nanoseconds. Or maybe you go from 100 to 60. It's not like amazing, but it's better, so we like it. We're going to take anything we can get. Okay. SRAM, remember, drives the data lines actively. Okay? They don't lose their brains you know, if you don't <laughs> refresh them periodically. Uh, whereas DRAM, you have this whole process of um, accessing the data in the capacitor. So it takes time. SRAM receives its address all at once. DRAM does not. It receives it in two parts. And uh, also, we don't have the overhead of refreshing. So you can see how SRAM is going to be faster than DRAM. That's fine. Go us. We can use these in different places. Okay. So DRAM is much denser, and this is the big upside of DRAM. So um, 
We can also scale the memory more easily because we don't have as many address pins that we have to route on our circuit boards and so forth. Okay? So we look at this picture and we say, well, clearly we would use these for different things. Okay? Like SRAM is what's used on your processor. Why wouldn't it be? Okay? You're already paying a boatload of money for that little chunk of silicon, so you might as well have some SRAM on it so it's fast. Okay? And DRAM we use typically on the motherboard. Uh, for storing large amounts of information. It's slower to access. And so the question arises, how do we make this fast? We're, gonna, we're not going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about it next time. Next thing we'll talk about, next show and tell. I'm sure all of you have probably seen these inside before. There you go. I only have the one. I could probably get a bucket of them if I wanted to, but uh, it's like, why? Now I have a bunch of hard disks that I use once a year to show people the insides. So um, if you look um, at an angle, you can see that I believe it has three platters inside. Um, so it's uh, kind of an interesting thing. I don't remember how large that drive was. The, um, no, I took off the, the thing. Maybe it's on the other side. No, it doesn't say how large it is. So I don't know how large that drive is. Okay. We use disks for storing large amounts of data. And by large, I now mean like two plus terabytes, right? Because boy, things are growing fast. We have multiple platters. Invariably, you'll have multiple platters on these devices by now. And it's covered with some kind of magnetic material. I picked this lovely orange, I guess, to denote rust, right? But you can see on the actual device that it actually is quite silvery. Um, so the platter surface is divided into tracks. So these are just concentric rings. It's not a spiral from the inside out or anything. It's tracks. And each track is divided into a number of sectors. Okay. At least in the picture, we have a fixed number of sectors around the device. Okay? Now we have the platter spinning at some constant speed. So you probably all turned on your computer or if you have a, a network attached storage. We have a network attached storage at home with like five drives in it and everyone's a and then it hits that uh, constant speed. So you'll have anywhere from 5400 RPM all the way up to 15,000 RPM tends to be the peak uh, speed that you see of these drives. Okay, We have a read-write head. Move it back and forth on an arm so we can slew it back and forth. And that allows us to read a track. Okay, So if we want to access a particular sector, all we do is we figure out what track the sector's in. We move the head to that track and then we wait for the sector to come by. Okay? And then we read our data or we write our data. Now, of course, these devices can be scaled by adding more platters. And a lot of times when you would see new drives come out, they'd say, oh, we have this much more storage. And a lot of times what they've done is they've figured out how to squish another platter in there so that they can increase the storage size by whatever the you know, you know, multiple of the platter size is. So we have multiple platters. And so now you can see that all these uh, read-write heads are on the same arm. And so they're all accessing the same track on their respective platters at the same time. Okay? So we call all of those tracks together a cylinder. Okay? So a cylinder K is a set of tracks on each surface of each platter. And there's one on top and there's one underneath, both of them. Okay? Those are all part of the same cylinder. So you can see that any given position of the, the read-write heads, I can read all the stuff in the cylinder efficiently. I don't have to move the, the arm back and forth. All right, everybody got it? That's how well, hard disk works. You probably already knew uh, much of this. I think most people are familiar with this. Now you notice, as people did back in like the 90s and so forth, that um, as you get further out, your sectors are getting larger and larger. So um, we're wasting space. You remember the, these... Uh, Substrates typically can hold information at some density, okay, beyond which you're screwed, right? You, you can't store information uh, more densely. But we have more space out at the edge. And so what a lot of modern drives do <clears throat> is they divide this space into zones. And what I mean by that is they may have like five rings, and each large ring is a zone. And each zone has its own sector layout inside that zone. Like you can even see in my stupid picture... The sectors on the outside are like three times as large as the ones on the inside. Well, if my read and write 
uh, logic is fast enough to read the data going by faster, then why don't I just cram more sectors in there? And so this is really nice because now I can store more data onto this device. That was a big step forward. It also really complicated interacting with uh, disks through um, assembly code. That was a, a big annoyance that they had to deal with um, when they invented zones. So two major factors for disk performance. We have how long does it take to move that read write head to the appropriate track okay that takes a lot of time and it depends on where the previous thing was that you looked at okay so you have your worst case seek time where you go all the way across the platter you know from the inside to the outside not you know <laughs> if you cross the center you're screwed but uh, anyway you're going back and forth but if you're doing like a track to track seek that's going to be a lot faster then you also have the question of how long does it take for the data to come around you may be waiting up to one revolution. This is why we have server hard disks that are spun at 15,000 RPM, because if they're spinning faster, then I have to wait less time for the data to come by. Okay. So seek time, oh, well, fortunately, uh, you know, most hard disks aren't quite this bad anymore. You'll typically see something around the six to eight millisecond time Really fast server drives, you'll see a couple milliseconds on seek. Rotational latency for 7200 RPM is, worst case, one revolution is eight milliseconds. But average case, sometimes it's going to be right there and sometimes it's not. You're going to see about half of that, so four milliseconds. So you can see that accessing data on a disk could take a lot of time. Now, 10 to 30 milliseconds for us is... Pretty fast, right? Human beings are slow. But for the computer, it is bored out of its mind waiting for that data to show up. Okay. Any questions about this? All right. Next thing. Last thing, in fact. Um, solid state drives. Who here has a solid state drive in their computer? Yay, right? It used to be that when I would ask that question, like one or two people would put their hands up. But now everybody's got them. And they're so much nicer, so much faster. But they are flash-based, entirely electronic, so you don't have any seek time anymore. The seek time is addressing logic, <laughs> and the addressing logic is fixed. It's always going to take the same amount of time. So you see access speeds that are in the microsecond range, so tens to hundreds of microseconds. Okay. Now I say here that they tend to be more reliable than magnetic hard disks. Has anybody here had a magnetic hard disk fail on them? If you... Has anybody had a solid state drive fail on them? Okay, so the answer is no, but when they fail, they take all your data. They're like the nuclear option as far as data loss. Okay? When a magnetic disk fails, it tends to give warning signs, so you know and you can get ready. Not true solid state drives. They're there one minute and then they're gone the next, and you're sad because so is your data. Okay, so solid state drives do fall between DRAM and me mechanical disks in cost and in performance. Okay, so uh, like I have here, um, there is still a lot of reason to use spinning magnetic disks because if you want to have like four terabytes on a drive, you're not going to do that with a solid state drive yet. But you can easily do that with a spinning magnetic disk. Okay, like my NAS at home has five four terabyte disks in it. I'm not doing that with solid state. Okay, so these are block devices, just like magnetic. So you have sectors. We call them blocks, though. But they're weird, okay? And you may be somewhat familiar with this, but you're only allowed to write to a block that's empty. If it's got data in it, you're not allowed to write to it anymore. And so if you have empty cells, then writes will be fast. That makes you happy. But the other weird thing about it is you can't erase individual blocks, there's this other unit of block called an erase block. You can erase all of those cells at once in the erase block. You can't erase individual blocks, at least with current technology. And the other weird thing is that the erase blocks typically hold many cells. And so like I say on the slide, a read-write block might be four kilobytes. Erase blocks will be a bunch of those together. So you might have two megabytes in the erase block. 
This leads to this kind of a weird situation. What comes into the solid state drive, and what, what goes into magnetic disks as well, this is the big change that occurred when we started having zoned disks and so forth. Instead of having cylinder head sector addressing, which was the way we all did it um, up until a certain point, then they said, this is dumb, let's just have a logical address from the beginning of the drive. So the first block is block zero, second block is block one, and so forth. Okay? Much more straightforward. Well, the solid state drive has a flash translation layer that takes that logical block number and figures out which memory cell it is in. Okay? So here is a 16 cell solid state drive, because we're really fancy, and we have three files on it. You can see block one of file one, block two of file one, block three of file one, and so forth. When you want to write to a file, so you're writing your little garbage collector and you say, oh crap, I haven't saved in 45 seconds. I need to hit control S or whatever to save your file. Well, what happens on the device is that it can't just store the data into the cell that it was in previously. So what it does is it marks the old contents old. Here we go, finally. And then it creates a new cell with the new version of the data. So this is what's happening every time you're writing to files. And this is an interesting characteristic. We don't talk about it too much in this class because it's kind of not the point. But we talk about it in the database class quite a bit. Um, magnetic disks support a different interaction than solid state drives. Magnetic disks support writing to data in place and modifying it in place. Solid state drives can't do that. And so different file system data structures are good and useful on magnetic disks versus solid state drives. Okay. But this is what's happening. So I write to the second block of the first file and it just marks the cell as old and then writes a new version. Okay. Now what happens is as you do stuff, your solid state drive ends up with a lot of cells marked old. It can't use them and remember it can't erase them without erasing everything in the erase block. So it has to start cleaning things up at some point. Now we're lucky, we have our first erase block, all the cells are marked old. So I can go ahead and blow all that away and now I have new cells that I can use. Okay, That's the good case. That's the case we really like. Let's say that we have more writes going on. Okay, So F2.1 prime gets written in there. If we have a situation where the erase block still has cells that are valid, like which, which uh, erase block has the um, fewest, or uh, let's say the most old cells. That's the one that we'd like to clean up. The one with the most old cells is the third erase block. Everybody see that? But we still have data in there. So what the solid state drive does is it relocates the good data to other cells so that now the entire erase block can be reclaimed, and then it reclaims them. Everybody see this? This is an unusual characteristic of this device. And what you notice is that sometimes when you write to these things, they perform more writes internally than the ones you actually issued. Because they're having to deal with erase blocks and old cells and reclaiming old cells and so forth. Okay? So this is called write amplification. And there are various tactics we use to minimize this. But it is um, the first generation solid state drives sucked because they weren't good at dealing with this. Okay? And so you'd have a device that would get, it was super fast, it was way faster than a magnetic disk, but then it would get slower and slower and slower because of write amplification. And then you'd have to wipe your entire drive and uh, put all the data back on it, and then it'd be fast again until it slowed down. Okay? We don't have that problem anymore, thankfully. Uh, any questions about this? Um, one other thing I'll mention, then I'll get to your question, uh, which is that the flash translation layer, you can see the flash translation layer is being updated all the time. So if you look at the various costs that are associated with interacting with this device, writing to it, the flash translation layer is updating its information all the time as versions of blocks are stored in various places. So yeah, question? So in that first case where you ran out of um, blocks and you had to create that first erase block that was like, really old, yeah. um, what if you got to that point and there wasn't many blocks that were all old? Yeah, so basically you can, um, if you had a situation where you had no blocks that um, were older, let's say that you had, uh, you had no available cells with which to relocate data, you're screwed. Your, your device is out of memory, <laughs> is basically what happens in that case. 
Do you have a flash stores uh, reserved capacity? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what I would guess. Um, I haven't studied these things in all kinds of gory detail, but I would imagine, like, you see this a lot in operating system design. The way you avoid these issues is by keeping some backup space so that you can deal with these situations before they become catastrophic. Yeah. All right, any other questions? All righty, let's see. So storage technologies, we use all of these things. Here's a comparison. SRAM, yeah, it's like... $5,000 per gig, no problem there, right? DRAM, $5 a gig. You can see how as it gets larger and slower, it also gets cheaper. <laughs> so we can get a ton of it. I mean, I would never build a 16 terabyte NAS at home with solid state drives. I just don't have the money. I'm a teacher. So, but I can scrape together enough money to uh, do it with hard disks. Okay, so you can see how all of this uh, plays out. Now, I want you to think about this in the context of processor performance. This is the very last thing we'll talk about today. You have this 3 gigahertz processor just ripping along, doing computations as fast as it can. It's, you know, branch predicting and speculative executing and leaking all your data everywhere. It's so fast. Okay? 0.3 nanoseconds. If that 0.3 nanoseconds was scaled up to one second, you can imagine how long all of these things would take to access. SRAM would be 3 to 30 seconds. Clock, clock, clock. Here's your data. Okay, the processor sitting around twiddling its thumbs, right? DRAM, one and a half to five minutes. We don't have enough time to wait for that. Class is almost over. Hard disks take like one to three years. Okay? Network, fast networks are about as fast as hard disks. Eesh, right? So you can see how we have a problem. We can't build a fast computer that uses all of these technologies if we have the hard disk plugged straight into the processor. So that's the problem that we're going to start solving next time. All right, so we'll see you Friday.